hello. Good evening, everyone. My name is Ashley Johnson. I am here at the Vernon Area Library, and I welcome you who are here in person, as well as those who are watching from home. I'm going to introduce Sarah Jamshidi. She is the Assistant Professor of Computer Science and Mathematics at Lake Forest College, just, just up the road. She began her foray into artificial intelligence, or AI, and specifically machine learning in 2015 as a graduate student at Penn State, where she collabor with, collaborated with Air Force Office of Scientific Research in methods for processing sensor data. Wow. Yeah, that's really smart. I She later worked with the Department of Cognition, Perception, and Autonomy at the Applied Research Lab at Penn State University, and her work there earned her the Intelligence and National Security Alliance Sydney Drill Academic Award in 2017. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Sarah. Thank you so much for coming. And uh, to those of you at home, we will take time for questions if you have them as they come up. So um, Please don't hesitate to use the chat or the Q&A, and that goes for those in the room as well. So welcome, everyone, and thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay, so today's topic, of course, is artificial intelligence, and that's a huge topic. Um, and then from my perspective, there's almost too much I have to say. So um, I want to encourage everybody to ask questions as they occur to you. I really would prefer a dialogue rather than me just talking at you. Um, because I, you know, there's, there's so many corners that we could explore and I'm very interested in tailoring this to, uh, the questions that you have, but the way this talk is structured is we're first going to really talk about, you know, what are these algorithms doing? How do they work You know, at a, at a high level? And then, uh, we'll talk about some examples and some considerations and concerns we should be having. So what is AI? AI is, um, basically a subject. Uh, or a topic where we build software that attempts to navigate novel environments in a way that's like uh, an organ, an organism, an intelligent being, a human or an animal. Uh, you know, most of the time when you're talking about computer programs, you're talking about explicit commands. You tell the computer to do X, Y, and Z, and it does that. But um, you know, modern AI is really much more based on statistics and randomness. So we sort of give some parameters and then we let the machine go. Uh, and so the way we do this is we build everything off of data sets. And the key is those data sets. We can only learn what the data can tell us. And that's actually a very important point that if there's one thing I want you to take home today, all of AI is dependent on the data set. And so your first question with any piece of software should be, what is that data set? And can I really learn what it, it claims I can learn from it? Uh, is there already a question? Oh, no, there was a point at the book. Oh, yeah, we're good. Okay. <laughs> All right, so, you know, when you're talking about AI historically, there are many approaches. Um, you can have a high level approach where you're sort of trying to um, give explicit commands. This is sort of the, you know, if this, then do this. Um, we also have some methodologies that will try to represent the world and um, respond to it in, in more prescribed ways. But most of it these days is inferring from data sets. So you say, okay, here's a bunch of examples. Based on those examples, uh, what's the best course of action? And it's just, okay, well, I sort of see this pattern. Let me operate according to that pattern. Oops. Now, um, when we talk about machine learning in particular, this is sort of a, an important corner of AI. Uh, there's a bunch of different ways to break it down. One of the nice ways is to kind of do something that's like a, re a regression where you're making an explicit prediction. And the other one is classification. It's a really great movie, Moneyball. I saw it recently. Um, there, it's really the story about how um, the Oakland Athletics tries to predict undervalued players. So, you know, there was a, a set value of what a player was at the time. And there, they were trying to see if there was an opportunity um, for, you know, a, a actual higher value based on the statistics gathered. There's also classification problems. And this one's one of the cutest ones I've ever seen. 
which is, is it in Chihuahua or is it a blueberry muffin? <laughs> and you look at those pictures and sometimes it's a little hard to tell. But that's a classification problem. That's something computers can do. Um, but there are way more sophisticated things that they can do now that build off of these ideas. Neural networks are a big part of what allows for these types of models to exist. In, in truth, with um, the, the money ball example, a lot of their stuff was just linear regression. I say just, but you can do a lot with that. Um, but with the chihuahua versus the muffin, we're really using something called a neural network. And these neural networks are basically built off of little smaller functions that we call neurons. And they have a historical reason for being called neurons. And those models, you put a bunch of neurons together and you build a model. And uh, what the programmer is deciding is, well, you know, what's the shape? Like how many neurons am I putting together? How does it, how would it, how does that look? And what are some, you know, small changes that we make? But it's the data set itself that guides the learning. Question. So how is the AI going to affect our lives? Yes. In which way? Yeah. Today and in the future. So I can't predict the future, <laughs> but I will give you some pointers. Let me, um, I'm almost done with this, like, what is AI? Um, and then from there on, I can give you some ideas about what to expect. So when people first start building these kinds of programs, there's a common problem that happens that's based on that data set. And this is, this is actually uh, something I ran into with a group that was trying uh, neural networks for the first time in Penn State. Um, so they, there's this belief that pregnancy and other types of um, health uh, outcomes can be inferred by the heartbeat. Um, it's not that widely held, but it is a belief. And so this research group, they had some data and uh, they said, okay, well, here's a heartbeat, predict whether or not this person is pregnant. And they got 95% accuracy, which meant 95% of the time, it could accurately correct, uh, you know, it could correctly predict, yes, this person is pregnant, pregnant or no, they're not. But when they looked at it more closely, they realized that their data set was 95% pregnant women. <laughs> So what the function did was it just always predicted that the woman was pregnant and that's it. Um, so it's the, the data set itself said, okay, the majority of people are pregnant. So just predict that they're pregnant and it's gonna work out. What's the problem there? The problem is that it's a biased data set. Um, so their model didn't really work, uh, but it's not easy to see if you're not paying attention to the data that you're starting with. Um, and the, this is kind of the fundamental thing I want you to know. With these algorithms, they're just trying to pick out a pattern. They're going to pick out the simplest pattern that satisfies that data set. If your data set doesn't represent reality, the model doesn't represent reality. So here's kind of a breakdown. And I think this is getting to your question, ultimately, of you know what the concept is, but an example as well. And a really common example where these types of algorithms are used is in credit scoring in determining what kind of interest rate you get, what kind of loans you have access to. And we all know that that has a huge impact on our daily lives, right? Our credit, oh my God, has an, at every day we use credit to purchase things and in very key moments of our life, we rely on credit to purchase something like a house. So a neural network is gonna rely on inputs and outputs. Your inputs could be personal data and your output is whether or not that person received credit. So this is historical data. And the question you should be asking yourself is, well, what do they mean by personal data? So your data set is historical data, let's say it's 500,000 individuals and you have information about whether or not they defaulted. Um, you would maybe take 400,000 of them to kind of build your model. And then the 100,000 other data samples you would use to kind of evaluate, was, is my model working pretty well? Um, and then afterward, you know, you might get something like your model can predict with 87% certainty based on that testing set, whether or not a person's gonna default. Okay, so what does that mean? When you're talking about personal data, 
It could be some stuff like income. It could also be stuff like zip code, gender, um, various things. And I want you to think in particular about historical data. What might be biases that exist with historical data in general? And in particular with some of the things that I mentioned. Um, defaulting on a loan? Yeah, with defaulting on a loan. It could be a dispute about the loan itself. And that could alter the, the significance of the, the alleged default. That's exactly right. Right. There, all you know is whether or not a default happened. You don't actually know the circumstances. And for subgroups, they might be uh, historically have had more instances where a default could have happened through circumstances that were beyond their control. Yes? Chad, the societal bias like redlining or access. Exactly, right? Maybe only certain groups received credit. In fact, we know of very explicit cases where they fall on race, they fall on gender, and other considerations. We're also not going to have great data with lower income individuals in general, but they need it the most. They need credit. We need to be able to issue them credit. And if we just rely on our algorithms, we might, you know, perpetuate inequity in society. Is there more? I was just going to say that when I um, share what's going on online, if you can repeat what I said. Oh, yes. Just, just yes. In the future, I will repeat what I've, I've been told. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you. <laughs> All right, the big thing to remember, correlation does not mean causation. You know, we're, that's really what these machines are doing. They try to build a correlation and then they, they sort of build it in such a way that it seems like those inputs cause this output, but that's not really what's happening. And the more we are skeptical of that, the better our relationship with AI will be. So let's kind of talk about some really interesting cases. Um, one of the most famous cases was a Twitter bot that was built by Microsoft called Tay. Um, and Tay was learning to respond through human interaction. One of the worst places to learn how to be a human is online, <laughs> especially on Twitter, which I guess is not Twitter anymore, it's X. But uh, at the time it was Twitter. And, you know, there was a trolling campaign to uh, train this AI bot to you know, just say horrible things. And it worked, it was very effective because ultimately that bot is just constructed from the inputs that it receives. And it was a, a really bad data set that people were able to feed it. And so I think it really highlights, you know, data is what uh, determines these algorithms. Um, so again, there's one thing I want you to take away. The data is the learning. We are just taking data sets and expanding them outward. So when you think about really big software, the ones that are making the news like ChatGPT, it's all based on the data sets that they use to construct that algorithm. That algorithm is very sophisticated. It uses many different layers to it. But the question you should always be asking is, okay, well, what is the data set that it's being built off of? And you know, where might be there, you know, where might the problems in that data set be? Okay, so these are the big questions that we want to really think about when we're thinking about AI. How can we thoroughly vet these algorithms and understand the patterns that they find? Right? We know that they're finding patterns, but are they the patterns that we want them to find? Are they actually the right patterns? How can we standardize the process of building these models to ensure some kind of optimality? How do we ensure our models work equally well on all kinds of data without bias? The reality is we can't guarantee that. How do we build models that transfer to new situations? This is a huge area of research. And how do we program context? So I was just speaking with a colleague who was telling me that um, she and that collaborator were successful in building, um, you know, a, a, a specific model within AI to identify covert, covertly racist tweets 
And the challenge of being able to even identify something like that is to understand the context in which it's being said. So it could be something that sounds very innocuous. Let me get you some shampoo. But in the wrong context, that's actually a very racist thing to say. So, um, you know, it just depends. And that's actually a very hard thing for these algorithms to tease out. All right, let me pause here because let's bring this back to the real world. I really only gave you one example, which was the credit one. And I hope that one was scary enough. I'm about to scare you a little bit more. <laughs> so let's think about when these algorithms come into play. Sentencing. So if somebody's charged with a crime, there are algorithms that are being implemented that have been implemented for quite a while already that will provide a recommendation to judges regarding how long the, the uh, sentence should be. These are gonna be built off of historical data. What's the problem with that? History, <laughs> History has a great deal of prejudice. You're gonna find a prejudicial uh, sentencing against people who are um, you know, racial minorities. And you're also gonna find a uh, more harsher sentence issued to people who identify as men over women, for example. There's also weird cases where it comes up, for example, let's say you wanna go out on a date, right? You log on to, Twin, to Tinder. And uh, you know, at first, Tinder is gonna be giving you, um, you know, recommendations for people, but the process is trying to diagnose where you lie, what your implicit rating is, how attractive you are based on the way people respond to you. And over time, it develops something called an ELO score. And this is actually based on chess, weirdly. And so over time, it's going to start to give you recommendations based on that score. So there are several people that you're very unlikely to see based on how your score develops over time. Is that okay? Is that a problem? Something to think about. I think when you start to think about how relationships work in society currently, there, there are some issues that should come to mind. Um, additionally, we are implementing AI in several components of our everyday life. If you are interested in applying for a job these days, most major companies will have all of the resumes provided to them filtered out by AI first before it's ever seen by a human. So if your formatting for your resume doesn't suit the AI algorithm, it could be easily dismissed. That might be a problem because it means that you can't be that creative with the process. Um, so these are three examples I think where you can start to see, oh, we're automating so much with AI. We're building it off of biased data sets because all data sets are gonna be biased to some extent, especially if they're historical. And is that okay? All right, so let's talk about some more applications here. So, you know, there, there are some things to be skeptical about, but there's a lot to be hopeful and excited about as well. We can, for example, see AI improve medicine. Um, we can improve diagnostic uh, criteria, so we can have AI uh, implemented in helping with uh, various types of diagnoses. So, for example, um, when I was just getting out of uh, undergrad, I worked with a company that was building uh, software to help detect breast cancer, which sometimes is very hard to see by a radiologist. And so if they have, a, a, you know, an AI assistant that says, hey, this could be breast cancer, that could mean to more, that could lead to more meaningful screenings and to, to save more lives. It also has the potential of personalized medicine. Currently, the way we do medicine is we have a, a drug, we give it to a bunch of people, we say, you know, how many people did it work for? Maybe it only works for 10%, but 90%, it actually has really bad consequences. We say, this is not an acceptable drug, we get rid of it. But it would be great to know or to be able to accurately predict. What's special about the 10% for whom it works? So we can start to have more nuanced medicine where in some cases people get access to um, a drug that maybe they wouldn't have even tried 
until things got very severe. Um, so there, there's a lot of potential here in terms of our ability to predict things. It just depends on how we build those models. So law enforcement is a really interesting application um, that are that's both hopeful and scary. Um, as I mentioned, sentencing is, is a common application. We also have software that allows for tracking of fugitives on CCTV systems. So uh, this is facial detection. We also have emotional detection through interrogation. I think that the science behind that is not well established. So this one I'm, I really have problems with uh, because not, you know, in terms of emotions, that's highly cultural. And uh, you can't always detect someone's emotion from their facial expression because one facial expression in, in one culture might look very different in another. There's also drunk driving detection, sort of looking at cars and being able to analyze, oh, this person might have a high probability of a drunk driver. That I'm very excited about. There's also uh, robotic potential. So self-driving cars is something we've talked about. There's also self-driving or self-flying airplanes. In fact, most airplanes already rely heavily on autopilot. So I think that's gonna be something in the very near future. We're also gonna have a lot of a lot more robotics. Maybe you have a robo vacuum, but we might have more uh, implemented in areas where I think we, start, we need to start asking questions. So for example, in Singapore, there are robots that watch for undesirable behavior. The image there is specifically uh, based on a model that's done by um, Boss Dynamics. And they're, they're kind of scary looking, like the robotic dog. Uh, but they can actually help with search and rescue, which is really helpful. Another big area is natural language processing. And this is sort of the backbone of something like ChatGPT. So um, there we're looking at text analysis. What's the sentiment of the text? Is the text positive or negative? What kind of tweets are we seeing? And this is actually very important because currently on all of these social media platforms, we have a very horrible problem, which is that people will post very, very terrible content, triggering content, hurtful content, hateful content, but also just disturbing content. We primarily rely on humans to filter that out. They're not paid very well, and it's psychologically a very damaging job to have. So, you know, you see something bad, you flag it. Often it's a human who will see it and say, yes, this is uh, terrible content. But that person is then checking all sorts of flag stuff throughout the day. And they're seeing the worst of the worst. They're seeing abuse. They're seeing violence. That's, that's a horrible job. I don't think that's something a human should ever be doing. But in, in, uh, with AI, it is something we can train a computer to do. And a computer won't be harmed by that. We also have this ability to generate new content that never existed before. So we can generate images, we can generate videos, we can generate music. It's all done by AI, we can generate art. And it's sort of fed in a bunch of different pieces and then, you know, a new thing is created, a person who never existed a painting that never existed, but it's largely based off of the work of a particular artist. We start to then run into problems of attribution, right? If your data set is, you know, all the works of a, a living artist, and then you start to generate art that's in their style, should that artist get royalties for that art that's generated? I mean, the AI could not exist without that artist but that artist wasn't involved in the generation of that content. Um, AI can also modify content. It can add or reduce noise. It can increase or decrease sharpness. It can uh, age a person or de-age a person. People have seen these filters all over. So you can sort of see what you look 10 years like older or 10 years younger. Um, and all of these are really fun, uh, you know, modifications to, to make to your image. But again, you start to get nervous when a person can, you know, pretty accurately impersonate another individual, right? And then large language models, this is where chat GPT falls. So large language models, they take in lots of different kinds of data. 
They're built off of lots of different um, models, including neural networks. And all of that stuff is construct, uh, allows for the construction of various kinds of information. And so content is generated. You ask a question, you know, any question you might have, what would be a really great set of sites to visit when I go to Rome? And it'll generate an itinerary for you. And it's taking in lots of data that's all available on the internet. Okay, so quiz time. We're generating data from the internet. That's how ChatGPT works, right? It's 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 siphoning off all the stuff that's online right currently. What's maybe a problem with that? Privacy. Yeah, privacy. Absolutely, privacy is a huge problem. What else is there? Facts. Yes. So, in terms of the reliability of the facts. There's been cases, at least with the older generations of ChatGPT, in terms of it just making stuff up and then making up references. What else? What's bias about online data? Yes. Does AI have the ability to analyze, to interpret, or is it strictly garbage in, garbage out? Yeah, <laughs> that's a great question. So the question is, is AI able to interpret? And basically you're asking, is it able to curate or is it just garbage in, garbage out? And the answer is it depends on how it's implemented. But the curation aspect, how well it can rank sources is highly dependent. And I would say that we still have a long way to go. Yes. Permissions. Permissions, right? We don't have permissions for a lot of the data that was gathered by ChatGPT to generate that information. Now, I think that's very important when you think about artists and not just um, visual artists, but also uh, you know, several individuals in the arts. Uh, if you're talking about writers, for example, and then you ask ChatGPT to generate you know, a story, a short story, or you ask it to generate a comedic script, guess what it's basing that off of? Content written by individuals who will get no credit for that work. So already you should see some issues. I also think that online presence is highly biased. It's highly biased in terms of where you are geographically, right? The Western world has a larger presence online than uh, other portions of the world. And then who, or, um, you know, who has the resources to, to post content uh, from which this, con um, from which ChatGPT draws from is also gonna be heavily biased, right? So I think, I'm hoping at this point, the ethical concerns are clear to you. We can have deep fakes. Does everybody know what a deep fake is? So a deep fake is basically video that's made to look like somebody else. This can happen in really horrible ways. Um, so, for example, you know, a person can impersonate a famous individual. That's very common. In fact, there's lots of uh, joke content uh, online already of that. But then there's there's stuff that can happen to everyday individuals where their faces are superimposed in video content that is explicit, which can be damaging to their reputation because it can look very convincing, but that person never participated in that video. There's also this problem that you can have a database of faces. So without realizing it, your face may be stored uh, within several corporations, possibly with some governments, uh, based on whatever rights you agreed to, you know, when you when you click on those terms and conditions. There's also this profiling that happens. It's been happening for quite some time uh, for targeted ads. So, you know, there, there's a lot of data on you. In fact, there's a really great story of a journalist um, in France who got all of the data uh, collected by Twitter, uh, sorry, Tinder on her, and she received about 800 pages worth of information. And the information that they had was, you know, also predictions of like when she would be most lonely, um, you know, how many people she texted and messaged, you know, how often she repeated the same joke to several individuals, things like that. These, these profiles can be quite robust. And 
the better you know somebody, the easier it is to manipulate them emotionally. And that's, I think, a concern. So in the wrong hands, with the wrong applications, this is a problem. Yes, question. So how does this um, facial distortion or or a deep, deep face? faces, how does that uh, play out in the court system? What if someone doctors up a photo to show that person A met with person C, but person A testifies that he never knew person C, yeah. and then up comes a photo. How do we know that's real or created? That is an excellent question. So the question was, suppose you know we consider deep fakes and we consider it in the context of a courtroom. So there's a claim that two people know each other, but the person on trial says, no, I don't know this individual. But then utilizing deep fakes, there's a, a, a picture that's generated. How do we know? I think that's a great question. And I don't have a clear answer. Very scary. It's very scary. One, I mean, we have some very light tests that help us detect um, very basic AI applications, but they're not perfect. So, you know, in, in my teaching, for example, if students were to generate content with ChatGPT, the tests that I have to detect that are fairly rudimentary. So I can't say with certainty whether or not they wrote what they claim to have written. And similarly, when you're talking about image doctoring, um, there's some indications within the pixels that we can pick out, but with a really good algorithm, there's no way to tell. And so we need to start thinking about, and people already are, this is not like a new idea. We need to start thinking about AI governance. AI is here, this is the reality, but how are we governing these systems? What are the regulations that are being put in place to ensure that these algorithms are not being abused. But I do think that it means that we have to rethink several systems. Anything where we're evaluating humans, we're trying to detect something about humans, we now need to take into account that we can fabricate, really in, in very convincing ways, we can fabricate information about them. And also we can manipulate them in ways that we were never able to before. So, you know, there's kind of the, the classic story of like you go on Facebook and then all of a sudden, you know, two months later, you're like very angry. <laughs> that's not you. That's, that's, that is in fact like a, an engineered thing because you engage more with social media when you have extreme emotions. And so there's a vested interest in these algorithms to make you engage more. We don't always know what the pattern is, but sometimes when we figure it out, it's not what we want it to be, right? We don't really want to be making people angry. But angry people, oh, they will return to Facebook over and over and over again. Um, so here in this slide, what I want to talk about are four mechanisms. So one of the problems that we have is that the designers of these algorithms can often, you know, they have their own biases that come into play. Fallacious beliefs in biological determinism is a really great one. So this would be, you know, and this has happened where somebody tried to determine criminality just based on someone's face. And that's a that's a problematic setup from the beginning, right? Um, there's another example um, that I've seen where somebody was trying to detect um, the likelihood that someone was part of a gang based on the music that they commented on on Twitter. <laughs> That's not, there should be no valid mechanism there. Um, and that these two are pretty scary applications, inappropriate applications of uh, AI that should be obvious from the get go. But, you know, again, the designers themselves are a source of bias. Cultural ignorance, as well as um, a belief in universalities that maybe aren't, don't exist. So this is getting back to that emotion detection. People emote differently based on where they're from. So when we try to detect emotion, we need to make sure that our data sets are robust enough to understand that. And I, I don't think they generally are because there are so many cultures in the world um, and we never have enough data. Um, there's also this problem where there's no evidence that relates the inputs to the outputs. 
So for example, uh, we see that with biases that might relate zip code, for example, to credit, that's highly problematic already. And your zip code can influence how much you pay, for example, in insurance. Uh, but those really, there's no mechanism there. Um, and then the example that I gave earlier, which was the pregnancy versus the heartbeat. There isn't a known mechanism there. So it was already a, a flawed setup. And then I believe that historical data is accurate when evidence exists to the contrary. And that's really getting at the, the problem of automated sentencing. It, the problem with AI, the thing that we should worry about is how it intensifies some of the worst parts of society. Colorism, racism, sexism, Western centrism. Um, when we build AI, we're building off of data sets where this information is already existing and can be magnified. And it can have pretty profound impacts on our technology. So here, this little GIF is uh, actually my dad and my son. And my dad is uh, darker than I am, and my son is lighter, fairer than I am. And the way in which the software for photographs are, it makes it very hard to see my father's face um, because of the contrast between my father and my son. And so I, I think that that's kind of an interesting and very, you know, it's not a scary case, but it really highlights just how pervasive this problem can be. So the thing to remember is that AI is not objective. We like to think that algorithms are objective because, oh, it was a mathematically computed thing. But it's, it's built off of data. And it's just trying to find a pattern. So, you know, is the data set robust enough that it can find good patterns? Often not. So AI skin cancer diagnosis here, it tends to be worse for darker skin tones because the data sets there are just not as good. We, we definitely have a bias in terms of the data that we collect. We're better at diagnosing um, certain diseases within certain populations, specifically white men. And so when we have AI, it's gonna magnify that. And so we might miss diagnoses that are specific to women. We might miss diagnoses that are specific to people of color. And all of these are huge issues. So AI, you know, it's happening on, it's happening everywhere. And it, you know, it's being implemented on imperfect data by imperfect people. Okay, lastly, I just wanna finish off with this issue of AI governance. This is something that you should want to see more of. There is currently not enough legislation just in the US, but also globally that governs what can and cannot be done with AI. There should be consequences when AI is implemented poorly. And I hope that after this uh, talk, you have a sense of where it's already being implemented, what the problems are, and why legislature, uh, the, the legislation needs to address this. All right, so I wanna thank you all for you know, listening to me and listening to my, my rant. <laughs> um, and I, I would love to just have a conversation about uh, any topics that you're most interested in. Yes, please. Is ChatGPT a site yes. or, or an app? What is it? Yes, okay. The question is, what is ChatGPT? ChatGPT is in fact a website that hosts um, a large language model. Let me see if I can access it here. I may need to just move it just a little bit. Um, and I can probably log in if I remember my password so you can see it. So now everybody has my email. <laughs> and then give me one second as I look up my password for it. But I'll show you in a moment what it looks like. Um, it's basically kind of like a search engine. But rather than taking you to explicit um, websites, it's generating content from online content. Uh, so open AI. Okay. 
my website it on my one. <laughs> <laughs> you guys just heard part of that. Should hopefully work. Oh. Oh, and so I can't actually log on here. I'm sorry. If you want to stop sharing, um, it, unless, uh, yeah, if you stop sharing because it's only showing your PowerPoint, oh. um, if you do any other browser, you have to reset share again um, and just make sure that we get your... Okay, let me just try one more time with sure. ChatGPT because I would love to be able to demo it just so you can get a sense of what it looks like and how it works. And we can even talk about ways in which you could use it to you know, to make your everyday life easier. So, um, for example, you know, I, I know of people who hate to write emails and they effectively use ChatGPT to generate their emails for them. So they almost never write emails directly. They sort of just say, this is what I want to say. And ChatGPT takes care of the rest. Um, I have a, a funny example. I recently went to a bachelorette party with my best friend who was like a we went to Savannah, we went to, you know, it was all ghosts. And one of the girls took our itinerary and put it in there and said, make an itinerary that sounds spooky. And it took all of the, the event, the day of the time, the place that we were going, and it changed all the words to be like, and then we will have a foolish meal for <laughs> And I was like, where did all this language come from? She said, yeah, how could you control, say, high school kids who are under a crunch and don't have time to write that paper and they go to chat with the sure. AI in some way and, and they say, write me a paper on XYZ in the year XYW. Yes. You know? So the question is, how do you know, for example, when you have a high school student who's under uh, a great deal of time pressure? They panic and they go to ChatGPT and they generate an essay, right? So let's say that um, they're reading the Scarlet Letter. So write an essay on the Scarlet. Oh. Letter. And it'll just construct one. Um, and there's, you know, for the most part, the content that it generates, unless you're given very details, uh, very uh, lots of details, they, it's kind of generic. And for most teachers, it's not going to get, you know, a top score. You know, sort of the ChatGPT has a way of sort of writing very kind of average, you know, sort of the average high school student level. Um, but there is no guaranteed way of uh, detecting it. There are some algorithms that can detect it some of the time. Will it always come out the same as two people in different parts of the world ask that same question? So that's a great question. So the question is, if two people in different parts of the world ask the same question, is the content always the same? And the answer is no. The content will vary, but it doesn't vary that much. So the actual wording will be different. I can ask two questions twice. Let's ask a question that has a pretty short answer and we can kind of see the effect of this. Um, let's say that, uh, you know, um, what is a good book for a summer read, right? So I can ask advice from ChatGPT. And so it'll provide a set of uh, recommendations. And if I ask the same question again, I will not actually get exactly the same answer. I'll get uh, something similar with a lot of overlap, but you'll see differences. So here's that same question. So I'm asking it again. Within the same query. And we can kind of scroll down sort of see what it's generating. But you can see already, the first section is fiction here and we have the alchemist, whereas before it was um, where the crawdads sing. So already you see some variation 
by asking the same question twice. Yes. What if I don't want to have anything to do with this AI? <laughs> Is it only when you activate it that you're at it? Oh, okay. So what do you mean? Okay, the question is, what if I want nothing to do with AI? So AI is being implemented without your permission. Without our permission. Without your permission in several contexts. Um, your, you know, companies that you rely on using AI uh, that affect the decisions made for you. So banks use AI, um, hiring, you know, companies that are trying to hire you use AI. Um, they're, they're, it's just everywhere. So you can't really opt out. So you're in it whether you want to or not. You're in it whether you want to or not. So I don't have to give it any information any more than it's at already. Yeah. So the question is, is um, do I have to give it, can I protect my information? And the answer is you have some limited protections. It somewhat depends on where you live. So there are better protections, say, in the EU as well as in California. Um, they have a, several uh, requirements of these companies to provide information that they collect on individuals. Um, there are some options where you can opt out. In fact, with ChatGPT in particular, if you want to, you can have them not store any of the questions you ask. Um, but you know, the terms and conditions for most online platforms do not give you the option to protect your information fully. Um, so. Uh, you know, if you're on any social media, all of that data is collected. All the comments that you make, all the things that you respond to, the, the time that you spend looking at something, all of that is collected. And that's a problem. Yeah. Question. Um, what type of legislation is under consideration? Oh, that's a great question. I'm not uh, completely privy to all the legislation that might be under consideration. Um, there, there is a, a pretty famous piece of legislation, I think it's, the acronym is the GDRP, I want to say, um, from the EU. There's also a similar one in California. And these have to do with privacy, online privacy, um, and access to the data that gets collected on you. Um, in terms of AI governance, right now I would say we're still largely within the, the policy writing phase. Um, so major... Uh, governmental entities, including NIST, uh, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, are surveying experts in the field of AI to write, uh, you know, legislation or to write policies um, uh, so that we can better govern it. But it, it's a big topic, and I think it's going to be a process that is just going to explode. I think this is going to be a new area of law. Um, to some extent, it already is. But most of the uh, the legislation that I'm aware of has to do with uh, data privacy. Any other questions? Oh, another question. I have a question about, um, I guess, your opinion on specifically libraries and the creation of content. And, you know, like libraries collect things. We collect published materials. Do you think that libraries should collect AI generated content? That's a great okay. So the question is, you know, the duty of a library is to collect materials. Should libraries also collect AI content? I don't know. <laughs> a book create, I mean it's going, it's it's happening, right? Yes. A book has been created through AI. Is that something that a library should? Hold in its collection. Yeah. So again, the question is, you know, we have a book created by AI. Should the library hold that in its collection? I, I mean, certainly there are books that really don't get adopted by libraries widely, right? Because they're just not that influential. So I think the influential aspect is going to be a big driver, whether or not it's human or AI generated. But there's also this question of like. Having a robust data set of what is AI generated could help us in the future to distinguish AI generated content from human content. Um, so I don't have, I don't know. I really don't know. Like in terms of any question about what should we do, I really don't know. I, I have some opinions here and there, but I don't feel certain about any of them. Question. Is material generated by AI, such as this essay, copyrightable? 
It does anybody own it? Yes, that's a great question. Can you copyright uh, material generated by AI? I actually, my suspicion is that this has already happened um, because I, I suspect that AI has been used for content generation for articles um, as well as for scripts and things like that. Well, yeah, I mean, I think most people are pretty upfront about the utilization of AI for artwork, but there's no guarantee of that. And as soon as somebody has just sort of written it off as their own, they can copyright that. But um, because AI won't generate exactly the same thing every time, um, it's not it's not even something we can really detect. So I mean, that's a great question. And I, my, my answer to you is I don't know, but I suspect that the answer is it's already happened. Yes. Can you see a future where AIs interlock like one that artist data to feed into another and another about evaluating output, kind of like robots making robots. Oh my God, this is a great question. And the answer is this already happens. <laughs> yes. So in terms of relationships between AI, this is a, a setup. It's actually known as um, a, gener a generative adversarial network. And it leads to really good outcomes in terms of, you know, training an AI to do something effectively. What the a generative adversarial network is technically two different networks. One that's trying to classify something, you know, like, is it a chihuahua versus is it a muffin? And the other AI is trying to make content that would confuse the first one. Like here's, it just creates a picture and it says here, try to figure out which one it is. Um, and, uh, and that ends up making the first algorithm much stronger. So this already exists. When you're looking at something like ChatGPT, this is not really one single algorithm. It's not really the right way to think about it. It's a whole system, a whole system of approaches. Um, so the, the structure already exists. And I do think it's gonna get more sophisticated in terms of having AI interact with each other uh, in ways that I, I just don't think that we're gonna be great at monitoring unless we're very careful at laying the foundation right now. This is maybe more spooky than the stuff generated by ChatGPT, right? Because <laughs> AI is already everywhere. And uh, um, it's quite powerful already. And it's, it's gonna keep growing. Yes. It, it seems like it's so easy to use. And I guess like from my perspective as a as an educator, I think that how you combat it is trying to educate people the importance of critical thinking and the importance, like why would a student write a paper with chat GPT? Yes. Versus if that's your major and you're gonna be a doctor, like we need you to know those things. Yes. Like, yeah, sure you can use this tool. You know, it's sort of just like how we teach people not to cheat. Like if you want to cheat, you can cheat. But I feel like it's this sort of moral, I don't know, like if people are going to use it, they can use it. And it's, we hope that they use it. For good. Yeah. That's a great question. Okay, so the question, I'm going to try my best to summarize it. Yeah. As an educator, you, you need to sort of think about how this tool is being implemented in ways that can really have serious consequences. If you're talking about somebody who is in med school, um, who is training to do something very important and they rely on AI to generate content that maybe allows them to pass a class that they haven't passed, um, there's a problem there. How do we train people to use AI for good and not for bad? So first of all, I really do wanna emphasize that students using ChatGPT is not inherently a bad thing. There are bad ways to use it, which is write me an essay, blah, blah, blah. There are great ways to use it. So for example, let's say that a student is assigned reading and they don't fully understand the text. They can copy and paste that text into ChatGPT and ask, could you rephrase this text um, in simpler terms? So they can start to boost their own ability to read over time by you know, being able to reach into texts that are much harder to understand, right? You can have a middle schooler 
start to really understand James Joyce, which is very hard text to read, um, through a process like this. So it can be an assistant, it can be a tutor, it can lead to people becoming smarter. But there's an ethical component to all of this. And I think that now more than ever, we need to care about ethics. This has to be a component in our education, starting from a very young age. Um, and I think that if we can ensure that, you know, our, we're raising children to be ethical adults, they can start to think more conscientiously about, um, about AI and its role in society. And I'll also say that as a, you know, as a professor at Lake Forest College, I, I do have a lot of hope with the, the current generation. I, I see a great deal of sensitivity. I see a great deal of thoughtfulness. I also do see a great deal of pressure um, on them. Uh, but I'm, I'm very, I, I do believe like as, as we grow as a society, AI doesn't have to be a bad thing, but we really should be very careful and skeptical. Any other? Okay, no other questions. <laughs> Thank you all for coming and listening. Thank you. Please feel free to reach out if you have questions. There, there's one more question. Oh, one more Here's question. Okay. Um, personalized medicine gave me pause. The supplement industry is not regulated at all. Yeah. Um, were AI to be added in such an ecosystem, couldn't it be built on an irrational data set? Oh, in fact, we can even show this with ChatGPT. Um, yeah, okay, so the question is, uh, the supplement industry is sort of based on kind of, uh, you know, maybe one or two studies, which is not really a body of research. And uh, so people can believe that certain supplements are way more effective than, than we have any evidence for. And so you can start to think about personalized medicine, but you have to ask yourself, what's the data set that's being built off of? And that's a great question. And already, if you were to try to use ChatGPT, to give yourself like a supplement plan. Like let's say that um, you're very concerned about your, your knees. Maybe you have like creaky knees and you're like, what are our supplements? I can take for joint health. So this is a pretty common problem. And you'll see that it's going to make several uh, recommendations and uh, glucosamine, for example, is a very common one. Uh, turmeric is also a very common one. There's not a lot of evidence behind either of these. Um, and so, you know, you can already use, you can already use uh, AI for personalized medicine that's not really based on hard, well-established science. Um, so this is already a reality. Um, when I talk about personalized medicine, though, I do mean the stuff that's, that's uh, done within like the medical community. So I do think that there's potential for this to be done well, but currently it already exists to be done poorly. All right. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Have a great Thank night. You. Thank you very much. Have a great night. Yeah. Thank you.